visas. And so I thought, cool, Deb. <laughs> anyway, I just want to say th thank you for having me. And Ellen, happy birthday. <laughs> um, just to catch up people who don't know me or forget, I actually came home from Myanmar in August of 2016 and was officially uh, changed from missionary to Myanmar country advocate, which means I go back sometimes, but I'm trying to keep the awareness of the needs in Myanmar up. So I send quarterly newsletters, except this spring I send a couple because so much happened on the trip, so I hope you got to read those. And uh, I went back in the spring of 2017 and told everybody I'm taking one last trip in 2019. And at the end of my women's conference, God said, I don't think so. <laughs> so now I'm saying maybe 2021 will be my last one because I am trying to recruit younger women pastors that will go and continue the women's conferences. It's uh, really important, and I'll tell you later <laughs> as I get. Okay, go ahead. Anyway, I'll tell you, it used to be Burma for my age and older, and it's me and Mar. So just think like me and you, me and you, even though it's M-Y. And so it's between India, Bangladesh, China, Laos, and Thailand. And if you see where that little corner meets with Laos, Thailand, and Myanmar, that's that golden triangle. But up a little bit north is another triangle between China and Myanmar and Laos, and that's another triangle, which now is used mostly for human trafficking. All the other countries, they bring those human trafficked people into Thailand. Okay, next. So I actually went specifically for annual conference and the women's conference this year. Um, when I went in 2017, I said, because I'm now the Myanmar country advocate, I need to know about what's happening in other parts, because we're doing church planting over into Shan State and into Laos. And so I took some trips, and, which was really exciting. And before I left, Pa Kep said, when you come back, the people in the Chin State want you to go past Hakka, the biggest town, to the villages. And I said, oh, OK. But you'll see later why I didn't think much of it. So you fly into Kalamio from Yangon, and it's still got the propeller planes, and it's a little tiny airport. And even though I go on a business visa through ACE, Accelerated Christian Education uh, School there in Yangon, they're real particular. Where I can stay in private homes in Yangon when you get to Kalamio and up to Hakka, you still have to stay in the government approved hotels. You can't stay in private homes. And they're quite careful. Like the first time I went up there, he says, so what do you have a business visa for? I said, because I'm an English teacher. He says, and so what are you coming up here for? Oh, to see your beautiful mountains. Yeah. So this was the 25th anniversary of the Free Methodist Church in Myanmar. It actually started in November of 1994, which I thought was fitting because I was heading to Haiti, my first mission uh, area. But the first 20 years, we were a mission district under Taiwan. I, after I got there in 2014, just now, recent Bishop Matt Thomas came and changed it from a mission district to a provisional annual conference. And this was the fifth anniversary of that. And so that's the big picture of everybody. Missionaries from Thailand came. Uh, a young CMC from the west side of Washington came because his pastor said, if you're going to be a pastor, you're going to go on mission trips. So he did. Go next. So while I was there, I taught uh, the, in English in the high school as well as worked at the ACE school, but I also taught courses, English plus some theology courses in the small Bible college. Well, these four boys were first-year students when I, on my last year, 
And so they were graduating, and uh, so they let me do the charge and prayed for them. So that was a, a big honor to me. And we had our first ever uh, female pastor ordained this time. And a lot of you women will remember, she's been the um, women's ministry director for years. And all these people in Michigan were buying uh, motorcycles for the pastors because you couldn't, up to two years ago, could not get to the villages either walking or motorcycles. And she was trying to get to the villages to meet with the women's groups. And it took forever because she would walk and sometimes it took three days. So our women's group here in Bonners Ferry were mostly, there were a few people in Chuila, my other home church, who raised money and got her a motorcycle. And I wasn't even thinking about it, but her brother, who's a Baptist pastor, came for her ordination and said, oh, she told me you've been supportive for years. And you bought her a motorcycle? And I went, oh, yeah, I got to remind the Bonners Ferry ladies, we bought her a motorcycle. Yay, go ahead. They put lay, lays, you know, plastic and tinsel. She was oh, yeah, everybody wants to honor her. <laughs> and for those of you who read my newsletter, uh, it is illegal to print the Chin Bible. Burmese um, is the Indian Sanskrit kind of language, but Chin did not have a written language until the 1800s when American Baptist missionaries went and evangelized Chin State. But you can buy smartphones and download the Chin Bible app. So people in Michigan have been sending in a lot of phones. So I said, okay, us Washingtonians and Idahoans and everybody in this western part can do that too. So I was able to buy like 15 phones. And so these were the people who uh, received the Bible apps. Except this guy wasn't there that day. And so Pac pa kept said, oh, he's so excited. You've got to take a picture with him. So we did. And at the same time, we had the annual conference. They had the baptism. 13 young people and one adult over on the left uh, were baptized that day. Next. So I just wanted to show you, even though people look taller, Seth is way taller. He's our missionary in Thailand who has homes uh, to, um, to get the little girls and boys that are um, susceptible being sold into slavery and has started homes in Myanmar, Thailand, and Cambodia. But anyway, he's big and uh, Pakep is little, and so when they do baptisms, Pakep is the official baptizer and Seth is the bodily <laughs> baptizer. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to tell you about these missionaries over in Shan State. Uh, over on uh, the right, Pastor Sai uh, went out to a village, and I might have told you guys when I first got back about this, but just to remind you, he was going to do some American-style evangelism tools. And so he started visiting villages. And uh, he went to a village and took snacks and drinks. And they, him and his daughter were teaching them Bible, children's Bible songs and telling them Bible stories and then giving them snacks. So of course they came. And pretty soon they're saying, why are you doing that? And he says, well, I'm going to tell you how much Jesus loves you. And they go, OK, great. So they kept coming for the snacks. And only the man on top uh, supine got saved. Nobody else really cared. Until somebody in the village got bitten by a snake that everybody dies when they get bitten. And he prayed over him and was healed. And the whole village came to the Lord. Then the young guy in the bottom was in another little village I got to visit. And uh, his whole family came to the Lord through the years, and he was the big Buddhist holdout. You know, it was not. And, but when God finally got a hold of him, he's the one who became the evangelist. So I thought it was exciting. So then I go to another town, and this pastor, Davoud, had a little Bible college. And I met, and it kind of sounds like Nancy, so that's what I call her. <laughs> you know, was an older lady with all these young college-age kids, and so I wanted to know her story. So she was way up in the mountains, and uh, very animist. They weren't even Buddhists. And uh, 
uh, evangelist came and the city pretty much, or village pretty much shunned him. But he saw her and she'd been sick and hadn't been able to work for months. And so he said, can I pray for you? And she said, yeah, fine. And she was healed. So now she's excited and she's telling the whole village, I'm healed and Jesus loves you. And they kicked her out. So she went down to the <laughs> little, little city and found Pastor David with the Bible College and said, you know, I want to learn how to be an evangelist and I am going back to my village and I am going to teach them about Jesus. So I was excited about her. So I get to the conference and I see Pastor David and I go, oh, Pakep, I said, whatever happened to Nancy? And he goes, she's over there. She just graduated and her and this other lady are going back to the village. I said, hallelujah. I thought, what a, a nice completion to the story. So, I told you guys before, but when you travel from Kalemio to Hakka, it takes anywhere from 10 to 14 hours. If they've just redone the road, you can maybe get up there in eight. But when I came home, I thought, well, I better tell people how many hundreds of miles I travel. <laughs> 120. <laughs> and so, you can tell the roads are pretty bad. Go ahead. But... Look at that. Every time I go up there, I tell him, oh, this is like being back in Idaho. It's wonderful. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Next. So in 2016, before I left, I had the first uh, celebration, our first women's conference, and it was exciting. Next. This time, when I went, I had several different subjects. That time, it was an overall on forgiveness, which turned out to be powerful, you know, you think. But then I just talked about forgiveness at my church a couple weeks ago, and again, it just hits everybody. Because forgiving is hard. Keeping that forgiveness feeling is harder. And so we were talking about praying for each other. And I had found this little clip art, and I thought, this is important for us as well. Because believe me, they pray for you harder than you pray for them. So get busy and pray for them. They need it so much. But when we need them, you've got to know they're praying for you. And in my last newsletter before I came, I said all the talks I was going to have for the, the celebration for the 25th anniversary plus for the ladies' conference, God was just bringing things to me. And I said it was like the gears going together. And my first subject at the women's conference was going to be on prayer. And I'm going to church in Thailand before I went into Myanmar. And he was speaking on prayer. And I loved that quote. I have not looked up to see who really said it, but he'd been to a uh, uh, workshop and, and got that quote. But I, I thought, this is what we have to do, especially if you don't feel like it. Pray until you do feel like it. Next. So now I'm up at the women's conference, and this is the chin way of, of pulling people in because, you know, worldwide the women are outside gabbing, 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 <laughs> calling them into the services. Okay. And so, good thing Ellen gave me this because I do, you notice. I use my hands. You know, friendly people use their hands. Anyway, so Nuta, who's Pakep, who's the superintendent, uh, and they run the Bible college and the uh, boarding school down in Yangon. She's got a, a degree in chemical engineering, so she teaches all the extra math classes, plus pretty much runs the schools while he's running around, coming to the United States, raising support, and going to visit all of the churches that he's supervising. And there's our women. And I was thrilled because at night, the younger women who were either working or, or going to summer school would come and lead the worship. And that felt a, a really good about reaching the next generation. So Leitiel is um, meeting with the WMI president to have their WMI meeting. And I had them do it the last time in this one, and they're so excited. And it was very discouraging to know that our WMI has folded up. So I'm saying, you keep doing it, and maybe the Americans will get on the ball again and start back up. Because, <laughs> I mean, 
That's how we've supported these women. We've supported, uh, or WMI supported Lake Teal for a whole year um, so that uh, she could visit the villages next. And so you can see we grew this second one. So at the end of the conference is when I knew I was going to come back because they were doing testimony time. And I was talking about to step into the authority the Holy Spirit has given each of us to share. And I kept saying over and over, don't just learn this stuff. Go back to your churches and teach the other women. You know, uh, I had all my stuff sent ahead. They translated it, put it into booklets. I said, this is so you can go back to your church and teach it. And um, I said, it's important. Have meetings. Have co your own conferences. So one lady stood up, and uh, she says, you know, I never thought the Free Methodist Church cared about the spiritual development of the women until Pastor Carol in Utah started having these. Because the Baptist Church have women conferences all the time. And the Free Methodist Church, of course, were small, had never. And she says, and I never thought I could stand up and preach. And she says, but I'm going back, and I'm preaching. And the very next week, she had a conference in her church, and they sent pictures to me. And I was so excited. I said, they followed through. It's so cool. And that's when God said, yeah, I think you better go back. <laughs> so I wanted to show you again. So you see Laos. Next. When I was in Thailand from 2007 to 2009, there was a Lao man who had been a refugee years before, came as a teenager, uh, became a Canadian citizen, wild and crazy childhood or teenagehood, and somehow got a job in New York, and he was at a motel. Christian TV came on and accepted the Lord. Well, he had cousins at our uh, Rainier Avenue Church in Seattle, Washington. So he went and wanted to learn more about Jesus that he had just uh, learned about. And so they discipled him for a while. And he says, I feel like God wants me to go back to Laos and reach my people. So they said, well, you got to go back to Canada because you're a Canadian citizen and go to Bible college there. So he goes, kind of walks in. I'm sure there's a few weeks, but promptly has a heart attack. And that church just came around him. It always makes me think of the mother hen. And uh, helped him nurse back to health, sent him off to Bible college. And when I got to Thailand, he got to Thailand. And he was working towards getting into Laos, which he finally did. But he was only there a few months. And people realized that his English classes were a cover for Bible classes. And he got promptly kicked out. So when I went on that trip in 2017, uh, the man in the orange and several other people met with Chan Suk right at the border and talked about how this guy could go in and Chan Suk could support him through that. So they did that for the last couple of years, but this last year Chan Suk had another heart attack and died. But God is blessing that ministry. I, I, not, I didn't bring my notes because... You know, I know this story, right? But anyway, I believe he baptized 30 people this year. So please pray for our work to Laos. So after the, the retreat, we had our little outing. Because a lot of these women are up in this little village with nothing ever. And, you know, so we had to go see the outlook overlooking Hakka. Next, we can go through these pretty fast. And there's a drum up there, and I did that the first time. This lady did it for me this time next. Of course, there's stairs all the way up that mountain, but we drove around. <laughs> and that's the entry from the road. You have to go up the steps and crouch down through that. It was kind of cute. Next. And we were having fun. Okay. Next. And I just thought that was so cool that that love sign was there because truly the love of God was all around us. Then they took us up to the swimming pool and I said, oh, all you people swim? No. I said, what'd you build a swim pool for? For the kids. I said, well, do the kids swim? Well, not yet, not till school starts again because March, April, May is summer there. And so this was uh, first part of April, next. And just to remind you that most chin fem uh, 
people are farmers and for the last three years their rice fields have flooded and they're starving. Go ahead. They still use the old slash and burn method. Next. But I just want you to know that we have got a lot of agriculturists going to the country now and saying, you know, rice is probably not really good for the mountains. Oh, the fruit and the avocados, believe me. The avocados are wonderful. So when you're driving up the mountain, I always have to stop and buy a bunch. But up to two years ago, this was the road or pathway to the villages. So you either walked, like the Bible college kids would walk the three days into Hakka, catch the bus, ride it for 30 hours down to Yangon to the Bible college or the boarding school. Next. Well, now India and Burma, or Myanmar, have decided they want to reopen their trade routes. So India is sending in equipment next, and you've got roads being built and, and re updated. And like the ones we rode on into the villages were like the old logging roads. I figured from when my dad used to take me out to the fishing hole, you know, in the 50s. Next. But even though there's big equipment, mostly the Myanmar people are doing it old school. They carry the tar and, and drip it through holes in that container, and then the people just get the gravel and and they got it down to a fine art. But of course, it doesn't last good, so they have job security. <laughs> Next. Just wanted to remind you about the mountain people and how, where they build their houses so they're close to the road. And they go way down in the valleys and have their fields. Next. So I've got a wrap skirt. They make this for Americans. But the women, when they wear their longi, it's a round tube of material, and it's the way they tie it, so it looks like a wrap skirt. And I kept saying, you're retying that thing 100 times a day. Why don't you pin it or you know, uh, uh, hook it or whatever? Until I saw Pa Kep's mom, where you stop, everybody has to go potty, the guys just go and turn their backs to you, and I'm going, no bushes. She goes, undoes it, pulls it up to her shoulder, crouches down, and I said, oh, you got a portable outhouse, okay. <laughs> so we get up to these villages. So I had asked Pa Kep when we got there, were we still going to the village? And he says, I don't know, I've got to check with the village chief. And that's all he said to me. So we go up there, next. And it's poorer than you can believe. I mean, so poor. However, just before um, we got there, we saw this brand new dam they would built. And they've actually got lights now. They still cook over the wood. They still have their sad irons from when my mom was growing up, where they put the charcoal in the iron and, and use that. But they do have lights next. And they all told me in the four villages I ended up visiting that I was the first white foreigner that had ever been there. And I'm thinking, well, maybe from the 1800s. But anyway, for a long time. So this took here a church office. This is your normal bamboo uh, building. They have built a nice little church that would be right where I am in that picture, which was built by Michigan Free Methodists. So I'm saying, OK, I'm going to the other villages and us, Washington, Idaho, and Free Methodists are going to help build some other churches next. I just wanted you to know uh, that the Burmese government supplies two teachers to every village. And if you've got 70 to 300 kids, you've got two teachers, elementary level. Other than that, you send them like to Hakka for our free Methodist um, junior high. They call it a hostel. It's a hostel if you just give them room and board and you know they have a place to study and you teach them the Bible. It's a boarding school if you do all that, plus you teach them the extra classes. So down in Yangon, we have a high school boarding school. But the malnutrition is horrendous. They told me that this village of 30, if I could give them $1,500, they could buy enough rice to get them through the year. 
but I'd already designated my money. But anyway, just keep that in the back of your mind. Go ahead. So India is just over the next mountain, and so they're getting solar panels. Pretty amazing. So I was so surprised in all this poorness, you had the power pole and the solar panels. Next. Okay. And this is one of those elementary schools. Next. So this is the village that did invite me, and they made a big deal of it. So I get there, and they're all dressed up in their chin finest around that corner quite a ways, and so we all had to get out and shake their hands and shake their hands. So at the end of the women's conference, the women all came up and shook my hand, except one younger woman who wrapped her arms around me and started crying. And she cried and cried and cried. And everybody's looking at me and I'm looking at them because I go, you know, I can't talk to her so I don't know if she's just happy or what. But anyway, she was in that line. So we both yelled and wrapped our arms around each other. And I walked off into the village with her after I shook everybody else's hands. Next. Well, they have this big meeting and they've got all the pastors in that town which i think there were three different churches a baptist church a, a assembly of god and free methodist and and they gave me this letter of honor no go back one um because i was the first full-time free methodist missionary in their country and uh, gave me a shawl and that letter of honor and Lays and the city council guy was there. He tried to get me to support him improving the football field, you know, the soccer field. But they were all giving me their stories, and I was having it translated. And I'm thinking, thank you, Lord, you've already told me what I'm giving the extra money to. <laughs> Except I went outside. Well, after we ate. So they're so poor, and you think they're starving, and yet they spend money they did not have and put on the big feed, and you've got to honor them by eating it, and go ahead. And here the ladies have worked hours cooking over the wood uh, fire, and, and now they're brushing away the... And it makes me think of the old uh, English people in the old days where, you know, they had everybody fanning them in Burma. And I felt bad, but, you know, that's their way of being hospitable. Go ahead. We went to another town, and uh, that was the church. And they had bought land and wanted us to come and bless that property. And when I saw that church, I said, yep, it's time. It's listing. <laughs> okay, next. So we got to bless that property and lay the foundation stone. I was also able to uh, um, bless another property. So the first time, first place we went, there was not a church. We have one of my Bible college young men uh, doing a church plant. And the chief of that town attends that church plant. And his wife is married to another Free Methodist pastor. So he has a guest house, the chief. And we all stay there, and I think this is real cool. And as we're driving away from that town to go to the town we're in now, Pa Kep says, you know, it's illegal for you to spend the night in that village. I said, what? He goes, yeah, good thing the chief is a free Methodist. <laughs> okay. But that's why foreigners don't go there, because... You have to spend the night because you've been, you know, gone so far and everything. I just want to tell you about cutting wood. So, guys will go and cut wood and leave it. And I mean, nobody touches it. You know your pile, your wife knows your pile, and nobody touches it. So the women come, they load it up, and next. Walk miles and miles and miles back to the village. Okay. So while I'm there, and they're saying, see right over that mountain ridge? That's India. And just clear as a bell, God said, you got money extra. You know you're gonna, they're going to have to smuggle Bibles in, but you're this close. You could talk to people who could go into India. And so I said to Pakep, God just said, 
buy $500 worth of real Bibles. And he says, well, you know, they're only going to bring them in about 10 at a time. And I said, fine, however, just do it. And so even before I left Yangon, I got this message from Leitiel. And uh, 13 actually came in. I don't know where the other ones are, but 13 came in on the first batch. And there's been a couple of other deliveries. And they're spreading them out next. Now, I wanted you to see this about the main people groups. Sean are over to the right, and that's mainly what they're reaching, but they're also reaching down uh, just next to Chin State, and then, of course, into Laos. But um, when the tsunami happened, and our Bishop's Relief Fund sent uh, money for rice to Pakep, he not only shared it with our free Methodists, but the Baptists and the Buddhists. He went to the monks and said, I'm going to give you this much rice. You can spread it out to your people. Well, why? You know, to tell you about how much Jesus loves you. So you've been hearing about the Rohingya and everything going on, and they're Muslims, and there's fighting going on all the time. Pakep, this is his third visit, but he, first time he went, he took other supplies as well as those bags of rice, and he said, we want to share this with your people. And they said, why? And he says, because we want you to know how much Jesus loves you. And they said, you know, we've heard that name Jesus, but we have never met anyone who followed him. So our evangelism in, in uh, Myanmar is reaching Buddhists and Muslims and up to other countries. So they are truly letting the light shine. Next. Just for fun, real quick, just we'll flip through these. During the conference, Pakep went to the market and pretended he was buying the chickens for us to eat. And they probably were bought that morning, but he wasn't buying them. OK. I just wanted you to know, up in Hakka, the bathrooms way down there, it does not look steep from this viewpoint, but it is steep. And I had to have somebody go with me, because you know my foot was bad, and, and it's steep and rocky, and, and I knew I was going to fall. And uh, so I'm going to have the bathrooms up closer. Well, there was another missionary from Thailand. She said the same thing. So her husband was a little more verbal, and he's going to Pakep. They ought to build these. Well, I get back to the United States. Pakep says, look, they built them. They'll be ready for you when you come back. <laughs> OK. And so the main people groups, again, you see there's eight, but there's like 35 different subgroups and languages next. So there's still a lot of work to do. When we were in Thailand, uh, my oldest daughter and her oldest daughter got to go with me. And Bonnie and I were saying how funny it was, because back in 93, I came to visit you guys and ask you to support me when I went to Haiti. And Wendy and Anna were with me. And we don't, I can't remember where Lowell went. But anyway, Bonnie met us all over here at the Parsonage, and electricity went off. And so we were sitting and uh, gabbing and getting to know each other in the dark and had so much fun. So I just thought it was fitting to you know, take them to Thailand. And we went to the Long Neck Village. Turns out that what you think are Thai people are actually Myanmar people who had years before come over. And they truly do have those next things. And it's around the knees and the wrists. And so our guide was telling us, because when the husbands went out hunting, they needed to protect their women from the tigers. And that's where the tigers grabbed them. You know, so, that's, so now, of course, it's a thing. But there was a good reason. And then on the way back, I took a different tour. Uh, in Korea, if you have over a lay eight-hour layover, the government gives you a free tour, and there's several. Well, I've taken the downtown city tour twice, so I took the park tour. And it's kind of like a little cultural villages as you're walking along. And I thought this was so cute because they have like a little house on the other side of the fence, and they've got the cow mooing. So that was all for fun. So I just wanted to thank you so much for listening to me. I do have a sign-up sheet for those of you who haven't been getting and would like to get my newsletter, because I will keep you updated with what's going on with them. And if you would like to help me on my next trip, this time I am raising money for glasses. 
Nuta told me clearly, we only invited women who can read, because they know I always like them to read the scriptures as I'm going through my talks. And several times, the woman would go, I can't read this, and would pass it on. And I looked over at her, and she says, oh, no, no. They need glasses. They know how to read. So I talked to another friend who was a missionary in Africa, and she said, majority of them only need readers. So you can get readers for even less than the dollar store if you buy them in groups. So I'm asking if people would like to support that project. And so it won't be till spring of 2021, so we got time to raise it, and I can fill a whole suitcase with glasses. So in Myanmar, you know, I had to learn my two, three phrases in Burmese and my two, three phrases in Chin. So in Burmese, God bless you, is Peatikin kaunji pe base, and in Chin it's patieni thruachuana in pekose. God bless you.